Today, I'm gonna to tell you three tips that absolutely can change the game for you when it comes to calf training, especially things that you might not have heard before. So what's the first? Well, the first, and this is maybe the most obvious in some ways and not obvious in others, is the shoe choice. So many people, what do they do when they go to the gym? They just kind of put whatever shoes that they like to wear, generally speaking, on. But when it comes to calf training, it's my belief that having a little bit more of a rigid shoe is going to be a really good option. And I'll explain why in just a second and give a recommendation. But I often find that people are either wearing shoes that are way too flexible and bendy, you know, like a minimalist shoe that you can basically just fold like a pretzel, or on the other end of the spectrum, they're wearing shoes that maybe they would wear for walking longer distances or running, shoes that are really padded and supported. And I think a middle ground, a shoe that is supported but also rigid, is gonna be a really good thing. So no affiliate, no sponsor here. These are the shoes that I wear to train legs. Some of you might like a wider toe box and that's totally fine. The, the main purpose here, I, th I think these are Vans, yeah, these are Vans, is basically just to have a sole, right? You all, you all see the thickness of this sole that is pretty much going to be unchanging in terms of however hard you're gonna push up into the bottom of this thing, it's not gonna really smush. And that's gonna be really important for training the calves, specifically because if we think about what is the function of the calf, Right, the function of the two calves, the soleus and the gastroc, those are just fancy names for the calves, right? They basically just attach to this bone right here called the calcaneus, and they basically just pull it up, right? Via the Achilles tendon, many of you have probably heard of that. And so what they act on is they act on the relationship of the ankle joints. They don't act around the foot, right? So if the foot is bending all over the place, and this will play into our second tip here, the foot and the toes are bending all over the place. A lot of you may feel a lot of stuff in your feet rather than in your calves. So the first thing is basically just to put your foot into a shoe that is rigid so that the actual force of the foot plate is not going to have a really easy time bending your toes and all these little bones and the relationship between the bones all over the place. Okay, so rigid shoe choice number one it would be great if you had a rigid sole. The second biggest thing is foot placement. Now, what do I mean by foot placement? Well, a lot of times when people are going to initiate a calf raise, whether it's a seated or a standing, which I think are both great options, and I think that you should do both of them in your program, just my opinion, is um, where specifically on the foot you place um, to actually you know, push through a platform, whether it's a leg press or a seated calf raise, like I said. And many people will intuitively put their foot down on a platform and they will place their, basically like the far end of their foot, their forefoot, where all of these toes are. So if I hold this up to the camera here, I don't know if it'll focus perfectly, but you can see just how many individual joints are in the foot, right? I believe total there are over 30 joints, right? Many of which are, are in here, but where there is not a, a real big space for a lot of motion in the foot is specifically through the middle of these bones, right? You can see that these bones are a little bit longer. They're kind of like the base, the equivalent of the base of the fingers right here. And if you place your foot on whatever platform you're using, right on this sort of row, in essence, a simpler way to say this would be right below the balls of the feet. This is a space where no matter how hard you push against this, there's not gonna be motion occurring at least within these actual bones themselves, right? There are tons of joints here, right, of course, but when you press against these bones, these bones are incapable of moving, hopefully, right? Ideally, unless they're somehow breaking. But, you know, imagine what happens if you place your, your foot um, on the platform closer to your toes, right? There's a lot higher chance that like any one of these individual segments is gonna be a lot more loaded in terms of them actually bending all over the place. And likewise, if you were to put your foot a little bit too high, now all of a sudden you have all these bones, hopefully you can see this, right? All these little individual joints which have the capacity to sort of move around and shift around. So when I say placement, what I really mean is place, and this is gonna be a general description here, place your foot a little bit more forward on the platform than you think. In other words, where you are primarily contacting the area that you are pushing into, make sure that it's not close to the toes and that it's not sort of close to where all these bones are. Make sure that it's somewhere in between those two. And a lot of times what happens is people will start here and then as they go through the calf raise, they'll roll up onto their toes. 
that may be fine for you in some instances, especially if the actual platform you're using is pivoting, which is tends to be rare. But overall, my advice is to pick the space below the balls of the feet. You can play around with that sort of window, but again, just figure out sort of where these bones are for you, exactly where those bones feel like they're being most directly loaded and use that to actually push through the platform. Right, because again, if you don't do that and you're on either end of the uh, sort of spectrum that I described, too high or too close to the heel, you're probably going to feel a lot of stuff in the foot that has to manage the foot, rather than just being able to actually move through the heel as would be the role of the calves to perform. All right, so tip number three, and the last one here, relates to the challenge of each calf raise variation. This is gonna to apply to either seated or standing, right? Or straight knee versus bent knee. What do I mean by challenge? Well, a lot of you will notice that when you are doing your calf raises, that you get to a certain point and you kind of get stuck. And you'll see like a lot of, you know, older school bodybuilders doing this, for example, they'll calf raise up to a specific point and then they'll kind of jut up a little bit farther from there. So it's like, everyone seems to be making their calf raises sort of two sections. One that's like the initial thing and then there's this little bounce toward the top. And basically, in my estimation, what that's an indication of is that you are using a resistance, an amount of resistance on your calf raise, which is really, really light for this bottom half, right? So when you're in the bottom of a calf raise, it tends to be really, really light for this bottom half. And then we get to a point and we're like, Ugh, I can only sort of like squeak through that top end of the range. So what ends up happening is people end up perpetually underloading the bottom position and overloading the top position. In other words, the challenge becomes really only specific to this top position where you're at the peak contraction, which is fine to have at some point in your program, but if you are perpetually ignoring using amount of load that's good for the bottom half or challenging for the bottom half, then you're gonna have all this extra range that goes untrained. So imagine, let's say, if you're doing a press to grow your pecs, imagine if you only just did presses like in this top half, would you see some growth? Absolutely, but just think about how much more you could sort of milk out of that set if you were actually able to challenge that bottom position. So what I personally, my personal strategy for calf raises, whether it's seated, whether it's straightening, bent knee or straight knee, is I like to use two separate loading parameters. So the first is I'll do like one set or two sets where I'm going through this full range. I'm getting all the way to the top to that like really squeezed portion of the motion. And then what I'll do is on my subsequent sets, let's say I'm doing four sets, I'll do one or two sets with a load that's appropriate for that full range, getting all the way to the top, uh, to that top squeeze position. And then I'll add more load. And oftentimes this ends up being a substantial, you're gonna be so surprised at how much more load you can use. You get to the top, you finish those first two sets, you add load, and then just use a load that is appropriate basically for this bottom half of the range. In other words, you can essentially treat it almost as two separate exercises, one of which is prioritizing the challenge of the top position and then when you add more load you should basically add an amount to where you can't get to the top position even if you tried your hardest but what you'll notice is that you're going to be able to do a ton of reps probably as many as you did in the squeezed uh, variation again prior to this this uh, second kind of variation where you're just going through the bottom half of the motion and so what we're ultimately doing by just keeping this in mind is that we are, if we have a full range of sort of range of motion of the ankle in either the seated or the standing calf raise, bent knee or straight knee, you wanna just at some point during the week, perhaps train the entirety of that range. And that's kind of my personal stance in most muscle groups, which is you can, can train them sort of more in their squeezed or shortened position, and then you can train them when they're more stretched. I think it's great to sort of be able to train both ends of the spectrum. So whether it's, you know, four sets on a day and you make the first two, the first variation where you're getting to the top, squeezing at the top, and then the second two become more those, you know, sets where you add load and you're just doing the bottom half to make sure you challenge it, or whether it's you have two separate days and one of them is dedicated to more of like a squeeze focus and another day is just solely dedicated to that more stretch focus. However you like to sort of organize it will just depend on sort of what your week looks like in terms of your training split. So each of these three, three things is obviously related, at least in some sense, but I think all of them will yield a much sort of better outcome in terms of overall calf training and calf development. So I hope this helps.